Let's make sure this microphone is picking up our voices as it should. Wait a minute. Inflammable means flammable? Indubitably. Irregardless of what you say, regardless means the same thing. How can irregardless not be a word when people use it as a word? Doesn't that make it a word? It's become so popular that it's in some dictionaries now. So now now it's an official word, right? Right. Why do you park on a driveway and drive on a parkway? Questions we may never know the answer to. Why do hot dogs come in packages of six and hot dog buns come in packages of eight? To sell oh, more, don't get me started. To sell more hot dogs and or buns. I like buns. <laughs> I bet you do. And welcome to another episode of Embassy Exclusive. This is a monthly supplemental show for fans of the VG Embassy Game Music Podcast. I am Ed. I'm Joe. I'm Todd. And each month we get together and share video game music, the latest news in gaming, and our overstuffed yet half-baked opinions on both. This is episode 51 for November 2023. We hope you enjoy it. I'm actually half-stuffed and overbaked. Well, that, the overbaked part I can understand for sure. Yeah. I'd like to let the listeners know that Ed physically waved when he said hello. Did I? To you while yes, See, I told you, man, I am burnt <laughs> already. It's been, well, it's it's Thanksgiving weekend. I'll be releasing this at the end of Thanksgiving weekend. So um, already between Thursday and then having to go back into work on Friday. Oh, yeah, for work. Yeah, my father-in-law and his fiance just came over for lunch and left not 45 minutes ago and then... You guys came over immediately after that, so I'm like, for an introvert, it's a lot of socializing. And I'm sure I hear you. many of you folks out there can understand that. Um, but I'll try not to wave whenever I say hi again. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just I'll just keep making fun of how big Joe is. What? <laughs> <laughs> no, man, you, you got me all wrong. Yeah, so uh, we do hope everyone had a lovely Thanksgiving weekend for those who are celebrating it. For you Canucks and non-United States citizens, I hope you had a great thursday a great day a great a great weekend because this will probably be coming out i don't know monday or tuesday depending on how i get my ass in gear and edit the whole thing together um but that being said let's catch up what you guys been playing how you doing uh pretty good i'm uh, playing a lot of the same stuff i'm still playing uh, marvel snap on my phone all the time i uh as like you know a downtime kind of game or when i'm waiting for something to happen uh, enjoying it a lot, getting into the strategy of it more. Uh, still haven't given any money to it, but don't really think I will. I'm just having fun playing it. I yeah, like it doesn't seem like money really enhances much. It, it would unlock cards faster, which would allow me to build my deck faster, but I'm just having fun with it, and I'll play it until I get bored of it. It's a good time killer. Um, on console, I am playing uh, a game called After Image, which is a very good Metroidvania that I started uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, highly recommend it to both of you guys. The platforming isn't too difficult, but it's got fun exploration, all sorts of hidden stuff, and it's done really, really well. One of the better ones I played this year. And uh, for when I'm fully baked, uh, <laughs> I've, been, I've been playing uh, Mario Wonder, which is phenomenal. I am very, very happy with it. Cool. Um, I'll, I'll get more into that later, but uh, that's uh, a game I'm enjoying a lot. Right on. I have finished Horizon Forbidden West, which was excellent, but enormous. Um, way Just bigger like your than, mom. Hey, uh, Ooh, we went there. <laughs> uh, way bigger than the first game. I think I finished the main story. I think with only like fifty-five percent of whole game wow. like, completion completed. Um, How and many there hours? was like eighty huh? in that in oh, that yeah, region. It's it's it is big game if you want to do everything. Uh, but really really good. They've added they added a couple of like new mechanics and stuff to it. <clears throat> so no complaints there. And now I'm playing um, uh, Undernauts. Labyrinth of Yomi or Yami or Yomai or some other pronunciation. Y-O-M-I? I'm not sure. Y O M I. Yomi, I think, if it's going by like Japanese pronunciation. Yeah. We'll go with Yomi. I'm, I'm cool with that. Um, which we will hear a track from in a few moments. Um, really enjoying it. It is a like a modern dungeon crawler type of game. Cool, cool. Um, <laughs> so I'm so glad you guys talked about how much you didn't like Inscription because I went out <laughs> and started playing it and absolutely fell in love with it. <laughs> um, one of my favorite games of all time at this point. Um, so beat it within the last month. Um, and then now there are, there's like a new game plus, which is like a, a fake DLC or a fake mod that's built into the game. And um, 
So it's kind of all oh, kind of like an endless mode, but you can add additional challenges on it to gain extra points to kind of build your deck. So it kind of turns into a more of a deck building game more than it is an adventure deck building game once you actually beat it. I really do recommend or I hope that you guys go back to it because it's so good. It gets um so it sounds like you didn't like you beat like the first couple of bosses. There's uh, there's there's so there's three bosses in that first cabin. And the after the third boss the game changes significantly. Does it? Okay. Yeah. It turns into more of a pixel art 2D uh, RPG oh, with really? okay. with uh, with card battles, and then I won't I won't spoil anything after that. But interspersed with that are live action videos of this guy finding the actual inscription game in the woods, and there's this whole kind of espionage thing where they don't know how this game came to be, and there's like it's cool. It's 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 got a cool cinematic component to it as well as the game that you're actually playing in IRL. Um, so I, I loved it, played all the way through it, got pretty darn good at it. Um, you were saying that you didn't know how to, like, you didn't understand what the symbols meant on the cards. And at least on the PC version, you just click on the symbol and it will bring up a, a, a like a book at the bottom of the screen that shows you exactly what all the symbols do. And I'm pretty sure you can probably do that on the Switch just by some I, sort of combination. I think what I'll have to do is start the game over again and watch like a couple of videos on YouTube just explaining basic gameplay again so I don't have to like yeah. annoyingly relearn it. Or just text me. I mean, like even if you want to like, come over some night and I'll just kind of like yeah show you the ropes and how to like get started with it. I'd, I'd love to do that. I'm willing to give this one another shot. Cool. I would probably be interested in watching a like a playthrough mm-hmm. of it somebody like who is good at the game and can play through it um rather than actually playing it myself as we have discussed yeah. i'm not big on card builders it does builders. it does have roguelite elements like you are supposed to die the first couple times because when you die but what about the make... first couple dozen times well <laughs> i mean i probably died at least 10 or 12 times before i beat that first act but you what you do is you start learning the cards each time you die, you get a card made of your character, and you get to choose the stats for it. You start to learn what makes a good card, what doesn't make a good card. So you start building these really kind of like overpowered cards that really help you get through that first act. And then things kind of reset when you get into the second part of the game. So um, you don't have to worry about like accidentally breaking the game or something by making a, a powerful card at first. So um, like I said, there's 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 so much nuance to it that it's just, if you if you really carry it out it's it's rewarding it's very rewarding the ending is amazing too um so beyond that after beating that i moved on to american arcadia which just came out um i think like november 15th like 10 days ago or something um it reminds me of a cross between um like limbo or inside like a side scrolling puzzly kind of game mixed with the truman show in terms of plot device and uh, it's got some first-person puzzly exploration stuff, like walking sim, I guess, kind of, but with 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 more action and stealth modes. Um, it's about a, a guy who discovers that the idyllic city that he's been living in is uh, under a dome, and everybody in the uh, city is being watched by people all around the world. So the city is kind of stuck in the 1970s while it's actually 2023 outside. And what they do is they, they take people that don't have big followings and remove them from the city and get rid of them and eliminate them, in quotes. Um, so he discovers this, and then his whole the whole game is his escape from this dome and what happens. And he's got a person on the inside working for the media company that kind of watches the city. So when you play as her, you get the first-person modes. And when you play as him, it's a side-scrolling adventure mode. Um, mixed with a, a really good story, really good voice acting. Um, absolutely recommend it if you like that kind of good story-driven, light on difficulty, but kind of heavy on puzzles and and, and narrative going Neat. for it. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Um, beyond that, uh, Vampire Survivors has released a like story mode game um, called the called Adventures, and there's three of them so far. If you have the beta version on Steam. And it is like a series of remixed levels from the original, from like the the main game, but with kind of a story built into it. And um, it's fun. You you 
go back to square one, you lose all the power-ups and everything that you got from your main game. So it's kind of like starting the game over again, but in a new kind of remixed way with some context of, of story and everything. So I just started kind of doing that, and it's kind of reinvigorated my uh, love for the game again. So it's been a busy gaming month for me. For sure. Sounds like it. Yeah, between Inscription, American Arcadia, and Vampire Survivors, I've been having a lot, a lot of fun. And a little bit of Truck Sim in there, too. The West Balkans uh, map area just got released for Euro Truck Sim, so I've been kind of cruising around there. And then um, Exciting Kansas is going to be coming out for American Truck Sim, so... Exciting. Can't wait to drive across flat plains <laughs> trying to visit every city. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's about that. Um, you know, Christmas is coming up, the holiday seasons are coming up, so there's a bunch of good games on the horizon so I'm looking forward to checking more out as we go maybe for uh, our next month's episode we can kind of talk about some of the the holiday stuff or some Christmas related or holiday related topics might be fun to do yeah yeah sweet all right so let's move on to our individual topics uh, we got a lot of cool responses from listeners today so I'm looking forward to getting towards those Todd what you got for us first as promised, uh, here is the title theme from Undernaut's Labyrinth of Yomi. Uh, this was released in 2021 on Switch, PlayStation, Xbox, and PC. Composer uh, Naoaki? Naoaki? Naoaki Jinbo. Be right back. Welcome back. That was the title theme from Undernaut's Labyrinth of Yomi, composer Neiwaki Jinbo. Is that what we decided? That's what we decided. Um, <laughs> yeah, this game, uh, I don't I don't know why. what it is about this opening theme. It's short, but it's to me, it's really good. I like it's, uh, it's kind of build up and then um, that sort of, I guess, chiptunes-esque sort of like. Yeah, it really kind of blends chip and symphonic together in a unique way. Yeah. Yeah, so I really like it. It's yeah. I was I was saying while we were listening to it that it's one of the few like starting themes that I will just sit there and listen to every time I start the game up. Um, it's short enough where like I'm not just sitting there for hours and, mm. um, and uh, compelling enough where I like to listen to it. So I really enjoy that. Cool. Um, my topic for this month comes by way of the last recon. Uh, please keep them coming, sir. I appreciate that very much. <laughs> uh, what? And he asks. Uh, and so, do, as do I, what is a game that you'd like to have in your collection that is overpriced because of the collector's market? And if you have obtained this game, what lengths did you have to go through to p- procure it, uh, as well as your thoughts on pricing of the collector's market as a whole? And actually, this is a great question because it uh, is something Joe and I discuss fairly regularly. It allows us <laughs> to uh, uh, be grumpy old men for a few minutes. <laughs> Prepare yourselves, listeners. Dun, dun, yes, dun. We're, we're going to grump about it. Um, uh, I don't think it's a secret to anybody that the retro game collecting market has certainly since pandemic become outrageous. Outrageous. <laughs> it was outrageous before the pandemic, and then yeah, it just but got it's more so outrageous. much worse yeah. now. And prices have come down a little bit, but nowhere, nowhere near what they were before pandemic. Um, and I don't know that they're that they're really going to normalize. I think this is pretty much what it is. I got grumpy once. Uh, disc-based games started getting very expensive. It was one thing when, like, 
you know, rare Nintendo cartridges were expensive or even Super Nintendo. But when I see a PlayStation 1 or even a PlayStation 2 game going for like $100, $200, and I think to myself, it's just a disc. Disc shouldn't be that expensive. Yep. That just gets me angry all over. Again. That, just that was a, like a line for me. We've entered the market. We've entered the era or the age where kids who grew up with disc-based games are now getting jobs and having their own expendable money. So these are their NES games. Right. That's why they're going up right now. Right, but disc games were produced with such volume because they were, you know, you could stamp out it. The market was much bigger, yeah. You know, there were more, it was much bigger certainly than like when NES was popular. Yep. But also CDs, DVDs are much easier to to stamp out than computer chips. Oh, for sure. So like there's so many more for the most part, I mean, not all games had big runs, but um, there, it just seems that there's so many more PS2, PS3 games than there were NES games for any given title. For sure. That, you know, the idea of Rare is less of a concern. Yeah, it seems like in this market, <clears throat> Rare is determined by how many people are willing to sell it rather than how many actually exist. Right, right. We were at the, uh, the mall last week. Uh, and for you younger listeners, that's a retail establishment that has a lot of different stores all in one indoor marketplace. <laughs> <laughs> the mall. The mall. Uh, yes. And at the retro store, they had a copy of Quan for PlayStation 2. Uh, and that's one of those, you know, random rare PS2 horror games. And they were selling it for $800. What was the name of it? Kuan. K-U-O-N. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Am I pronouncing that wrong? Kuan. Kuan. Yeah, I, I think I used to pronounce it Q1 or something like that. Oh, oh. It, they wanted eight hundred dollars for it, and I have no idea what condition the disc was in. I just wow. saw the, you know, it was it was in the case, and I thought to myself, like, how could a disc ever command that much value? And I mean, it hasn't to the extent that it was still in the case and no one was buying it. Yeah, yeah. But who knows how long it's been sitting there, though? Yeah, I mean, could be, could just they could have put it in there five minutes before we came in, or it could have been sitting there for you know six a months. year. Yeah. yeah. And there's also just discs that got low print runs, you know, specialized markets or something. That, but I, I don't know. I kicked myself because I had a chance to buy it, I don't know, like five years ago for a hundred bucks. And, you know, like we all did. And I'm sure we'll get into those type stories pretty soon, too. But uh, I, I I think that was like a record high that I've ever seen for a disc base. Yeah, no, that's crazy. I've never seen one that high before. And that just sort of made me grump all over again. <laughs> Um, is it a game that you're like really interested in playing? Not especially. Um, I, I like random obscure horror games. Um, you know, the, the other PS2 one that I would love to own is Rule of Rose, and that's also like a you know four hundred dollar game or something like this. some outrageous amount of money that I will never actually spend. Rather, I'll just emulate the game and play right. it that way. Yeah. Um, so I, I have no idea if the game itself is any good, but I, I find interesting these random obscure horror games. Rule of Rose is the wrestling game no, no that's rumble roses sorry yeah yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no rumble I get roses is a ps2 random obscure horror game. yes yes i remember that one now i don't click games so <laughs> i mean i don't really have much to say about this well i mean um, your uh uh your your collection oh yeah of, the tim um, fallen games tim fallen. they're all cheap as dirt like the most you'll pay for one is like 30 bucks complete in box i'm there, not there's, there's, no there's team- nothing there that it's a matter of finding them more than having the money to pay for them there's no tim fallen games that like command high prices none but. at all they're like ljn games like the games that people really don't want very much i think 60 <laughs> bucks i paid for uh spider-man and x-men arcades revenge like huh. that's probably the highest i'm gonna get um and that was cib right Yes, com- yeah, CIB with instructions and registration card and everything. Yeah. So, I, I, uh, there's nothing that I want in my collection because I don't, I don't value having the physical games that much. L- literally, the Tim Fallon collection is just something to look for when I go to cons. Yeah, fair enough. It, it, it's it's my own little collection game that I'm playing more or less. So. Yeah, I don't have really too much to say about this, unfortunately. Okay. Is there like a particular? Did, did you mention any particular games that you want that are too expensive? No, I haven't. We well, we were just we were discussing we're like the it. market. And then, oh yeah, you know, I mean the market sucks. I, market I sucks. totally agree. <laughs> it's rubble, very rubble, very rubble, expensive. Rubble, for, rubble. for somebody who I mean I used to have a lot of really valuable games that I have sold and I've made quite a bit of money off of. I had Tail Concerto and a whole bunch of like mostly PS1 games in like near mint condition that I sold off. 
Um, I still have Android Assault for the Sega CD, which is going for like a couple hundred bucks nice. new. But I, I, I kind of like that game. I'm kind of holding on to it. I don't really have any particular sentimental value to it. But if it goes up, there's like a, a value for that. If it goes up to like three, three fifty at some point, I'll probably sell it off. And then um, uh, Guardian Heroes on the um, uh, the Saturn, I have that complete in box too. And, you know, treasure games are usually pretty valuable as well. That's really all I have left that's like super valuable that I'm kind of waiting for. Uh, somebody do a fun video on it and all of a sudden everybody wants it. <laughs> so <laughs> Hype your own market. Yeah, exactly. I should <laughs> then announce should. at the end of the episode that you have one copy available. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do the Android Assault slash Guardian Heroes episode of VG Embassy and <laughs> watch the prices take off. <laughs> oh, man. Don't do that. You don't want to jump the shark or anything. <laughs> No, but I mean, that, that does happen. I've seen that with GameSack. I've seen it with uh, Metal Jesus. Oh, yeah, you know, for sure. YouTubers will talk about a game and suddenly, boom, everybody wants that game. Right. Me, it's like, oh, I think I have that ROM. I'll go check it out. And <laughs> I don't have to worry about it. I'm, I'm playing it three minutes after the, the video ends. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I mean, that's just... I Also, maybe another reason why I kind of like didn't go to uh, Retro World Expo this year was because I knew it was just like, there wasn't going to be anything there that was going to be within a price range of me getting and and there's not too much left there's finding like a couple of really obscure ones like incredible crash test dummies for the game boy complete box is going to be probably a real hard it's really hard to find like non mario complete in box game boy games right so the games left in that tim fallen collection are, are pretty much going to be the needle in a haystack stuff or paying ebay, eBay prices right yeah so, and that's not what I'm planning on doing until the market drops, or I just happen to have one fall in my lap. Well, unfortunately, at the cons, you're pretty much you're basically playing e- eBay prices. That's anyway, true too. So, yeah, right. although you can haggle a little bit, which you can't really do in person. Yeah, you can eBay, haggle them so. down to full market value. Yeah, <laughs> I know. That's about it. <laughs> I mean, there there have been a few at, at at Retro World that I've gotten a little bit below. And sometimes, you know, but the games I'm buying aren't really sought after ones. It's not like I'm going up there trying to buy a copy of, like, you know, Spider-Man for the 32X or whatever. It's like, hey, here's this random old game. Right. I'll give you this much for it. And they're yeah. like, oh, yeah, sure, why yeah, not? Yeah, they're you usually know. just looking to offload it. Yeah, I just have to, I mean, less for me to carry back when I leave the con. Um, um, my, uh, so, uh, if I may, my uh, strategy with this has been the only way around paying too much on the collector's market is... Uh, finding the console or the thing to collect that is currently not in favor. Um, right. So, I mean, you know, right now in late 2023, for me, that's PS3 and PS4 stuff. Uh, it's, you know, just past the um, market, you know, are paying a retail price for PS4 games anymore. Uh, the demand really isn't there because the PS5 stuff is coming out. There still have PS4 stuff still has quite a bit of value because it's the PS5 is reverse compatible. But I found that now is going to be the time to stock up on PS3 and PS4 stuff where you can still get them at an average price, you know, for commons of like 10 bucks or less or for PS4, like 15, 20 bucks or less, uh, which is uh, what Todd and I just did before coming here today. We stopped at Game Exchange and picked up some PS3 stuff. Um, whereas, you know, now if you wanted to buy GameCube or N64, those are just out of reach, basically. You gotcha. know, if you want anything other than sports nonsense. You're going to be paying $30, $40, $50 for, you know, first-party Nintendo things, and God forbid you want, you know, a random obscure RPG or something like that for GameCube. You're going to be spending hundreds. Um, So that's how I've been doing it, I'll say, for the last five, six, seven years or so, is trying to figure out what's out of fashion at the moment in the retro market and trying to stock up. Uh, I did pretty well with the PS2, PS3 stuff, I'll say uh, five, six, seven years ago, and now it's going to be you know the the last of PS3 and mo- more PS4 stuff now. So you've heard it here first from the Wolf of the Mushroom Kingdom. <laughs> Buy PS3 low, sell GameCube high. Yep. Oh yeah. yeah. If, you, if you have GameCube to sell, now is the time. There. Switch sure. stuff is getting pretty cheap too. Weirdly, even though it's still like the most current Nintendo console, yeah. like. It's been it's been around long enough. What is it? What's it been out now? Six, seven years, something yeah. like that. The first party stuff is still mostly first, yeah, but it's always going to be. That's that's just not going to change. Right. And right. if you want something really weird or indie or obscure, it's going to be limited run or special reserve, and those those never go on sale. Right. But you outside just, of that, like basically anything else on the system, 
Yeah, that's true. There that are a lot of uh, hasn't they, been released in the last six months. Plus, more and more rumors of you know a new Switch coming out at some point. Right. Yeah, that's going to drive those prices yeah. down too. So Switch will be pretty Dep- attainable soon, depending on reverse compatibility with uh, Super Switch or whatever they call it. Yeah, and, and like I said, I mean, I, I I stand by the fact that I think that the Steam Deck has put a big dent in the Switch market, and I think there are a lot of people getting rid of their Switches because they rather have a Steam Deck instead. So those games go along with it. And there's more on the market now. That'll right? drive the market down, too. Yep. Yeah, if you have some cash and you're willing to buy a system with a bunch of games, you can end up getting a really good deal because people will sell their Switch with, you know, five, six, seven cartridge games for basically the cost of the Switch. Yeah, exactly. All right. So let's uh, listen to what some of our listeners have to say. We'll start with Todd. The Dyad says, My coveted retro game is a little unusual for my normal taste. I already own most of the SNES games I had my eye on. I had an ordeal getting Earthbound with someone swapping the actual cart with Wolverine. Ouch. But pulling it, uh, putting it in the Earth... earth uh, swapping the actual cart with Wolverine, but putting it in the Earthbound shell. But after I had heard the Crusader of S- Senti... Ooh, good luck on that one. That's a good soundtrack. Yeah. It may have been on an LMH episode. I got interested in the game. I looked it up uh, a bit and seemed like it seemed like something I would really like. Around the same time, I had picked up a Genesis too. I saw a complete inbox copy on eBay for something like sixty or seventy dollars, but I couldn't justify it. Wow. Of course, that was probably a steal since it seems to sell for over double that. Yeah, try ten times as much. <laughs> I, had, I had an alert set up for eBay with certain parameters, but I don't think it will ever pop up in my price range again. Wow. Womp womp. Yeah. A CIB. I've never that, that's the white whale. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> I think that's like four hundred bucks just for the cart, let alone yeah. getting one in the box. Yeah. For, you get it. You've never heard of it, Ton? No. Oh, it's oh, a it's, it's a really good like Legend of Zelda style action adventure RPG. It's yeah. on it's on Genesis. Yeah. That's Genesis probably game. why I I like have it's, never really explored the Genesis. Makes sense. Yeah. One of like Library. the top five genesis rare expensive games oh, man, but i'll have to look but at it, it. Is, is also actually a really good game yeah and really good soundtrack too uh professor tom says shining force 3 is a game that's not in my collection because of prices and rarity okay thanks tom thanks tom yeah. <laughs> those shining force games for genesis are all in the like i think low hundred dollar range now oh are the, they the cartridges huh. yeah i have shining force 2 cartridge only i wonder how much that's going for at least i the last time i looked into it i think they're they're around that price but yeah they're they're expensive neat uh ryan Steele. okay uh he says <clears throat> quite a bit my most expensive games are ones i bought at retail and just went up in value mostly my fire emblem games because i was into the series from the first north american oh, game release nice. yeah fire emblem has definitely gone up uh, relating back to my segue which oh i think he okay so he submitted these backwards he's he's referencing <laughs> His next, <laughs> he wrote responses for both of our questions. So excuse this part. Um, uh, relating back to my segue, with okay, so we'll reference that later. During my collector phase, which you know from my segue, like, I took it upon myself to get every Tales game. Tales of Destiny one and two were expensive, and I traded a lot of games in, likely around sixty in order to buy them. Wow, which was un, which was around three hundred dollars for the both of them, doing the same process for Earthbound. However, in order to get the rest of the Tales games, I went to the source. I took a trip to Japan. Damn. That, he's going to lengths, man. Now, my sister was getting married, so I did that while I was there. But the real goal was to get these games, <laughs> and I wanted playable ones. Amen. The DS and PSP games were not region locked, so I scooped up ports or original games mostly. I went to every game shop I could get 10 to 15 Tales games. At the time, I was only missing two from the series, one that was region locked to the 3DS, and one that I could pick up in Canada at a later date. I've yet to play most of them since they are in Japanese say, yeah, and require a lot of Google Translate or an English script to play alongside. However, the experience was a lot of fun. I was like thinking about them. Like, can you actually play them? Now that I live on a farm, going to local game stores is not much of a thing, and the price of retro games has skyrocketed. I have moved on to console emulation, relating right back to the other topic. This is called either a callback or a segue. I win either way. Oh, I thought he was talking about when he when he said segue. I thought he was talking about the thing you ride. He spelled it like the segue that you ride, but he's actually meant S-E-G-U-E. Okay. That makes more sense. I was topic looking at changes. the word trying to, like, scratch my head. Yeah, no. So, so yeah. He, okay. he also wrote a response for your topic, Joe, which will make more sense when we get to his response from your topic. So gotcha. anyways, um, yeah. So, wow. Ryan really went through some lengths, including going to Japan. Going to the other side of the planet. And to as get a, games he couldn't read. As a side trip visiting his sister's wedding. 
I'd like to know how to get a copy of this podcast into Farmer Steele's sister's iPhone or whatever whatever kind of phone right? she has. Right? Yeah. So she can so she can hear what Farmer Steele's actual intent. Hey, hey, Mrs. Uh, <laughs> I, I would say Mrs. Steele, but it might not be her last name anymore. <laughs> Check out what your brother said about your wedding. What a jerk. Anyways, thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, the Jayad. Uh, yeah, game collecting sucks. I think that's pretty much the moral of this whole story. Don't and thank do you, it. The Last Recon. Um, and and uh, buy PS3 and sell GameCube. Yep. The end. The end. Good topic. Grumble, grumble. Grumble, grumble. Uh, oh, it wasn't... I'm sorry. It wasn't Joe's topic that Ryan responded to. It was my topic. Uh, but I don't generally read them. I just kind of copy-paste whatever people email me or put in Discord. So I don't know what he's referring to yet. So we'll get to that when we get to my topic. But for now, we've got Joe. All right, my track is Course Mania from Super Mario Wonder, released just last month for the Nintendo Switch. Composed by Shio Fuji, Sayako Doi, Chizaki Shimazu, with sound director being, of course, Koji Kondo. Mr. Kondo. All right, let's hit it. That was Course Mania from Super Mario Bros. Wonder, released just this year for the Nintendo Switch. Composed by Shio Fuji, Sayaka Doi, Chizaki Shimazu, with sound director Koji Kondo. That track was full of pluck. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of fun and silly, but like I said at the top of the game, uh, when I am not in my sharpest frame of mind, <laughs> or half-baked, as uh, you might say, um, I go for a game that's easier to play where i don't have to concentrate too much doesn't require too too much precision platforming um so i'll take a break from whatever metroidvania i'm playing and put on a mario game because they're they're fun they're not too difficult yeah i know there's some like tricky levels in in them but by and large they're easy to play they're bright they're colorful they're fun and that got me thinking what other sort of games are super colorful super i'll say trippy to look at or just have really great visuals they're they're just kind of fun to like Look at the colors, look at the artwork, look at the, you know, whether or not the game itself is any good. And Mario Wonder is good, but whether or not the game itself is any good, what kind of games are your favorite just to look at? You know, you look at it and you go, wow, like that's sharp or wow, like the colors are really bright or you love the sprite work or something like that. Um, That got me thinking about some of the other uh, games that I uh, have been looking for, one of which I actually just picked up today. Uh, a game called Alice Madness Returns for the PS3. Um, There's another uh, great game that's uh, a couple of games for PS4, the Psychonauts series. They're very colorful and trippy and kind of crazy looking. Uh, There's Super Liminal for PS4. And I think that was on Switch as well. Probably other other stuff. I'm I, yeah, I have it on, head. on uh, Steam. Um, there's an old PS2 puzzle game called Res, which is another good one. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and that got me thinking, uh, just like visually, it doesn't have to be trippy, but visually, what games do you guys really enjoy? Geometry Wars really weirdly comes to mind. When you talk about trippy, that's a game that definitely feels like that. Yeah, for sure. Lots I mean, I don't. Really I'm not familiar with that one. What's that for? Uh, there was a DS version, I think PS3. It originally came out on. It was an Xbox Live Arcade game, I think, originally. Yeah, maybe. Uh, it's I'm, like I'm a not twin sure stick shooter on it, kind of. But your shapes fighting other shapes. Um, I'd say like almost like the first Vampire Survivor style kind of game. It's really addictive. 
oh, nice. action I'll have to check shooty that out. gameplay. Yeah, but very very colorful and very like weird shapes and stuff. Yeah, and, and, and it was like it's like an endless game, so it's just like it just goes on and on, 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 on until can. you die. <laughs> yeah. Oh, cool. Ed, what about you? Um, Games are fun. That to was look it. Geometry Wars. Oh, stuff? I mean, uh, oh, well, Yoshi's Island. I really love the art mm-hmm. style in Yoshi's Island. Yep. It's very colorful. Um, that's all that comes to mind right off the bat. I'm sure there's more. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot. I I really like the visuals in the Katamari series. Mm. It's just got a very unique, colorful uh, art style to it, and especially the Katamari Forever, where there's like a different filters you can put over it so you can make it more like a cell shaded kind of game you can make it feel like it's like crinkly paper textures um very like striking dynamic visual styles in that game um what else <clears throat> not so much like trippy visuals but i've always thought that snowrunner has some of the best graphics i've ever seen just absolutely lush forests you can look well across the map you can see for miles and miles and miles you can get up on cliff tops and overlook you know, like ponds and rivers with mountains in the background, and you can drive to all of it, just similar to, like, Breath of the Wild. Um, speaking of which, Breath of the Wild is also kind of in that category as well. But what I like about SnowRunner is that even though it's taking, it's making some beautiful scenery, it's all functional. You, every tree you see in that forest, you can winch to, and it can help you get over a mountain. Or you see, a you know, a little tiny break in the trees, and even if the developers didn't mean that as a way that your truck could get through a certain area, you could try to force your truck through that area. Yeah, exactly. So it's nice that it it makes beautiful scenery, but also is part of the level design as well. So I really like that about that game. Um, That's what what I thought about um, the first Horizon game when I played it. Um, Mm. it earlier in the uh, PS4 life cycle and I remember sitting down and playing it and booting it up and just thinking wow like this looks sharp Um, and I I know there's way better than that now but at the time I remember thinking that the first time I played it and that just made me love the game and get into it even more and uh, it's one one of the reasons I'm psyched to play the sequel soon absolutely I've always really liked the way Mike Tyson's punch out looks I think as a as an NES game with those giant characters that are just full of personality um the art in that game was one of the some of the especially considering when it came out like probably some of the best art oh for sure the, the wii version of that game i don't i don't think it's a remake but the i guess sequel? oh yeah it's just called punch out I think. it's just right, right yeah right um i also i think was also done really yeah. well uh 100 it managed to hold on to like the that artistic spirit of the original but also the like mechanic the the gameplay mechanic of it um, but also, but while bringing it into a more modern, like graphical style, yep, for sure. Except that it was for the Wii. Yeah, Which, there's some good stuff for the Wii. Th- there are, but I I don't like that everything for the Wii was designed for the Wii Mote and not for oh like, well yeah regular controls. That, I mean, I felt like it worked pretty well because uh, you didn't. It wasn't moving your fists like it was moving like Link's sword in the Zelda games. You would just do the motion and it would actually do a the same punch every time. So it wasn't like if your punch was three inches up or you know yeah, yeah. an inch down, you wouldn't connect with the jaw or whatever. Um, also, what was I thinking of? The Last of Us in terms of oh yeah, our mm, fantastic yeah, good, good call. Um, when that I, first I, came out, I oh, love post apocalyptic cityscapes just as as a visual medium. So that game was like top notch, and the sequel does an even better job of doing that as well so yeah that, yeah good call on that one a lot of a lot of cool stuff out there. i'm sure i'm gonna think of like 50 more games after we yeah. stop recording um that was one of the things i liked the most about the show was that they took some visuals directly from the game or at least that they seemed yeah. to take oh some yeah for sure directly from the game and that was just i almost looked at that as like an easter egg for like for the gamers in in the show you know that they were almost shot for shot you know, some of them look the yeah. same. It just looked really great. Hey, fans, you'll remember this. Uh, but, but you know, some of those some of those set pieces were just so striking. You know, like a, a highway sign strewn over the, the, the highway that becomes a ramp to get up to the second level of a building. And they just had really unique ways of making the city's decay become a method for you to traverse through the city. And I really like that. Yeah. Uh, we don't have any visual. Oh, we don't have any visual. We don't have any responses from listeners for this topic. But if there are some games out there, guys, that you want to talk about where the graphics really struck you as being unique or awesome, definitely let us know in the Discord. I'd love to chat about this with you guys as well. Uh, and with that, we will move on to my topic and my tune. My tune is a very nostalgic one for me. 
And I don't hear it played a lot on podcasts, so let's give it a swirl. It is April Stage from TMNT Tournament Fighters, released on the Genesis in 1993. This was composed by Miki Hagashiro. We're back. That was April Stage from TMNT Tournament Fighters, released on the Genesis in 1993, composed by Miki Hagashino. Uh, fun tune. Like I said, I don't hear this soundtrack played a lot on VGM podcasts. It's not the best v- uh, Genesis music, but it's got some some gems on there. I do like this April theme. It's fun. Yeah. Um, this was, well, I think, one of maybe two Genesis games I owned as a kid. I got a Genesis mainly to get a Sega CD. So we got a <laughs> Genesis Model 2 with a Sega CD Model 2 when that came out. Um, it came with Sonic 2, and then we also got uh, TMNT Tournament Fighters. And I, I don't honestly remember owning any other Genesis games besides <laughs> this one and Sonic. So we didn't play a lot of Genesis games growing up. Uh, we did have a lot of Sega CD games, though. And... Um, so it just kind of reminded me of like my setup at home and I I remember this game had a sound test and listening to it and kind of thinking about how it didn't really use stereo that much and there were a couple of sounds here and there that went into different speakers and everything and then thinking more about how most people still had mono TVs at the time and they wouldn't have even probably known but I was lucky enough to have um, all of my systems plugged into uh, a decent quality stereo And so it got me thinking more about how people grew up playing video games. Did you have, like, a TV on a crate and it hooked up to RF? Did you have, like, you know, as video where available with good stereo quality speakers and a giant tube TV? What did you have? Do you think that your access to how much your parents let you play those games and how you were playing those games... um, affected the type of games you enjoy and what you enjoy playing now. So, kind of a psychological (laughs) game to play here. Um, My brother and I shared a bedroom, which was a curse for a lot of things, but in terms of, like, technology and gaming, it was kind of a blessing because instead of having to split things up between two boys' bedrooms and getting, like, two crappy entertainment centers or two crappy TV tables and two TVs and two stereos or whatever, we shared really nice stuff. So we had a very good entertainment center in our room with a 26-inch TV with, you know, all the hookups and everything and a decent stereo system because my parents are only buying one for the two of us. So I guess they just decided it was worth it. Um, So I didn't have anything else to reference to in terms of other people playing video games as a kid. But I think I got, as far as audio cons- is concerned, I think a lot of the reason I like video game music so much is because I just was hearing it over really good speakers and in stereo. And like I said, I was able to record it off of my stereo system because it had a tape deck built in. So the songs that I like, I was able to capture and, you know, listen to even after I like returned a rental game or something like that. So I feel like the stuff that I had growing up was a big factor on what... And, and also a lot of multiplayer games, fighting games, 
Contra, a lot of my favorite games as a kid were games that I could play simultaneously with another person because my brother and I would play all the time. So those ended up being some of my favorite, most nostalgic games. Um, I might have been more into regular single player games had I been an only child. So I was wondering, you guys, then we have some input from our listeners afterwards. Um, how did you grow up? What was your what was your childhood setup like? And how did how do you think it affected you in your gaming? Well, if uh, you were to try to draw a picture in your mind of the stereotypical late 80s, early 90s entertainment system setup, that would be what I had as a kid. It took up an entire wall in the basement. It was part bookshelf, part VHS nice. uh, shelf. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, great big old tube TV right in the middle uh, with some cabinets underneath. Uh, so when we were sitting on the floor, we always had to like look up at the TV. <laughs> Um, uh, but I always, I would bring the, the Nintendo down on the ground next to me. I'd have to have stretch out the wire as far as it would go so that it would still be plugged in in the back. Uh, but that way I wouldn't have to like stand up to, you know, change the games or reset them. Hmm. But, uh, I had my, I, I can remember vividly having my Nintendo plugged into that and having to sit like, you know, cross-legged on the ground. But I remember looking up, I'm looking up <laughs> as I, as I say this, Great looking the neck. up at the TV. Yep. Uh, because that was just, I could have put it, you know, sat on a chair, but I didn't because I was a kid and you just sit on the floor. Sure. And I just remember playing all of my games that way. Um, whether or not that influenced which games I play uh, nowadays, I don't know it, so much. I mean, I guess I still play a lot of single, single player stuff because I only ever played single player stuff. Um, you know, the opposite of you, I didn't have a, a sibling that played. Uh, my sister wasn't into video games at all. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, the, the the setup I remember vividly, and it's probably as stereotypically early '90s as you could possibly imagine. <laughs> what what kind of TV like did you have? Uh... Uh, it was an old RCA. I, I I don't know why I remember the brand because it was well because it, it was written probably you know, staring like, at, at the logo at the, every day at yeah. the bottom of the TV. Um, but it was a just an old box tube TV, kind of like the one right behind you know right behind where you're sitting now. Yeah, um, and it. We all, I remember to watch TV with it, we also had to adjust the uh, antenna on the roof, and we had a, uh, a box where you could, you know, uh, turn the antenna uh, to, oh, to try to get better antenna. reception. Cool. Uh, which I think at the time was, uh, I don't know if that was, like, newfangled or if it was... Well, I mean, most we, people had cables. Yeah, we never had cable, um, so we only ever got to watch TV that way. So everything was, like, kind of snowy, but when you would plug the Nintendo in, or the eventually the Super Nintendo, that was the only thing on the TV that ever got a sharp picture. <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll remember it for that as well. The only local broadcasting system in the entire household. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. What about you, Ted? My first system was an NES that I had to save up my $5 a week allowance Oof. and mow lawns and stuff yeah. to get, to pay for half of. So I, I got every bit of, of time out of that thing that I could. <laughs> um, I played, I played it a lot when I first got it, as you might imagine. Um, this was at the time when Super Mario Brothers was all the rage. Um, uh, and Duck Hunt, of course. And, um, and Zelda. So those three games basically were my life for probably the first, I don't know, six months or whatever that I had the thing. My mother actually was, I remember she, she told me later that she was concerned about how much time I was spending playing video <laughs> games. And so she actually brought it up to my pediatrician. Just a phase. Who, no, no, that's not, that wasn't his response. Um, no, he, that, that, was, that was my fake response. But. <laughs> he said, <laughs> he'll grow out of it. <laughs> he's, uh, my mother said, is it all, you know, is it like going to negatively affect him if he's like sitting there playing these video games all day? He's like, no, nah, it'll be fine. It's helping his hand eye coordination. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and so, absolutely. And so after that, my mother was less concerned, which, you know, I've, I've always been very thankful to my, uh, to my people. That could have gone either way really <laughs> good or really bad. It could have gone really good and really bad. <laughs> and it went well. He, uh, he didn't seem bothered by it. So, you know, yeah. that, that was pretty much that. Todd's pediatrician um, didn't need to buy new tires that day. Did not need to buy new tires that day, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so, um, or alternate timeline, pediatrician says, no, it's evil, and Todd would be a surgeon or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Uh, games was not was not something that I came across that often though. You know, Christmas and birthday, that t- type of thing. Mm. Or if I was if I wanted a game enough to save up my own my my own money for it, which you know took a long time to get up the fifty, sixty plus dollars at the time in nineteen late nineteen eighties money. Yeah. To um, to be able to afford one, um, so I had to get as much as I could out of every game that I got, and that's probably where. 
uh, RPG and long adventure games, you know, Final Fantasy and Dragon Warrior and Zelda and stuff like that came from where I could, you know, really, there was some real meat to it. Get your money's worth. Get my money's worth, yeah. exactly. So that's, um, I played I played my NES on an old Magnavox, probably 26-inch television, tube television. I remember I had a cat, uh, uh, Mookie at the time. Who liked to sleep on top of it because it was warm, of mm-hmm. course, as cats do. Yep. And if I was playing a game where the sprites reached the top of the screen, he would bat at them. <laughs> and so it was like he was playing games with me, which was fun. Cool. Was yeah. it was it um, a TV that you had exclusive use of, or was it the family TV? It was the family TV, but um, it was just me and my mother, so she didn't like spend a lot of time just sitting in front of oh, the okay, TV gotcha. watching it. So I basically had as much use of it as I wanted. Cool. That's cool. Yeah, we, we definitely had our own TV because um, my parents were just big TV watchers, so they would be on it constantly. And we didn't want to start fighting for the TV all the time. And I, that's what I always kind of wonder, too. Like, the kids who had to share the TV with their parents for video game time, like, were they less into RPGs and kind of long-form games because they only had maybe a half an hour or 20 minutes a day to play, whereas the kids with, you know, TVs in their own bedroom where they can play as much as they wanted got into rpgs better because they had more opportunity to spend more time with it that kind of a thing right um what about you so joe you sounds like you had a, it was a family tv that it was a family used. tv but i had to get yelled at to turn it off because <laughs> i didn't i didn't uh like i was the i was in front of it all the time yeah to this day you know my neck is still craned permanently upwards <laughs> so okay and you're and you're definitely into rpgs so yeah that no i follow I, my theory i i Maybe it led to me uh, not needing a lot of sleep as a teenager and as an adult because I would stay up all night playing Mm -hmm. because that was the only time that no one else wanted the TV. And I was into those lengthy, you know, games. Um, Yeah, you know, I never thought about it that way. But yeah, but I I guess it's it's either very fortuitous that I don't need a lot of sleep as a person or maybe I just trained myself during those formative years to not need a lot of sleep (laughs) because I was busy up playing Nintendo games. Very cool. Uh, we've got a lot of <clears throat> excuse me responses from our listeners. Um, we will start off with Red Hua, and he says, Regarding my setup, as you probably know, but not the other embassy folks, I was born in 1990, but I'm the youngest of five brothers, the oldest being our generation, 1978, so I had access to older platforms through them. So, the, so Red Hua's oldest brother is the same age as me. On the PC side, I grew up with both the MSX2 Arabic version, and I'm going to try to pronounce this. Red Hua actually sent me a voice uh, message on Discord with the pronunciation of this. It's called a Sakhir in Arabic. That's the MSX2 Arabic version. And a 90s compact PC, which he doesn't know the specifics. They got a higher tier PC later in 2002. On the console side, we had an Atari, although my memory of it is very hazy outside of River Raid and Caverns of Mars. But the consoles I did play growing up were primarily the NES and later the PlayStation 1, although we could borrow an N64 every now and then, and I had friends who had the SNES and Sega platforms, and I'd play games on those anytime I visited. And while this may not count as a setup per se, there was a recreational facility near my childhood home which had a massive pool, a snack bar, and a game room right next to it which had an arcade section. The arcade had classics like TMNT, Final Fight, Sinistar, TNK3, Metal Slug, various light gun games, and that showed me the more social aspect of co-op video games. As for how frequently I was allowed to play games growing up, I was only allowed to play during the weekends or holidays. School days were off limits. Wow, that's... Much more restrictive than most American kids, I think. Yeah. Yeah. As for whether this setup influenced my taste in games, absolutely 100%. The first games I ever played were games like Vampire Killer, the official Castlevania on the MSX for the uninitiated, uh, Metal Gear, Boulder Dash, Lunar Ball, F1 Spirit, and Double Dragon 2, to name a few. These games would pretty much be permanent... This, these games would pretty much permanently cement my love for video games and have me daydreaming of gaming possibilities until this very day. Also, games like Oddworld and adventure games from Sierra and LucasArts showed me at a young age that video games are well and truly artistic expressions as much as they are venues of entertainment. It's funny that he mentioned Boulder Dash. He actually reached out to me because Boulder Dash was one of the um, one of the video game puzzle games the zoom, that we yeah, played. The zoom it, was, out. it was this I think morning it was today, Zoom, right? Yeah. So uh, it's funny that he messaged me this yesterday and Boulder Dash was the game for today. Um, But that's 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 a lot of gaming. I, you know, I I literally know nothing about the Middle East and Redu grew up in Jordan and I had no idea the video games were even that popular over there or that many systems were actually available. And I do blame the American education system for not 
showing us anything about that region of the world as far as their culture goes. Um, but that that um, uh, the recreational facility sounds amazing. Like I would yeah. spend every friggin' day there <laughs> if it was nearby. That reminds me of the uh, roller skating rink that we had in my town uh, in the uh, '80s and into the early '90s. Oh, uh, yeah. that had a whole bunch of uh, uh, you know outside of the rink had uh, you know vending machines for food and had a bunch of arcade uh, uh, cabinets, uh, and that's how I. Uh, if I could, you know, beg for quarters for, uh, from my folks uh, to play a, a game or two, that's, I'll say, my a vivid memory I have of playing arcade games as a kid. Yeah, I, we had a couple bowling alleys uh, in town, and they would have arcade games, and we would go there all the time. Also, like, at the front of, I forgot whether it was Bradley's or Keldor, one of the department stores, the one in hand, and had a Street Fighter II machine, and I would always, always play that as soon as we, like, would check out. I would beg my parents for a couple of quarters. Um and he also says games like uh, like adventure games from Sierra and LucasArts, showing him the games are art. When I had a an old Mac SE, like my first family computer at the time, black and white screen, um, newer than an Apple II, but way older than like a you know like a Windows ninety five or three point one machine. Um, there was a game called Cosmic Osmo. I don't know if you guys ever heard of like the Manhole, which was another kind of similar game on yeah. for PC. But Cosmic Osmo was a like a point and click kind of an adventure game it would you would just wander around these really bizarre landscapes and click on things and silly things would happen and you could travel from planet to planet and kind of like it, it used hypercard i don't know if you guys remember that from the old mac days but it was kind of like um uh like a more interactive version of like powerpoint where you could make screens with interactive elements on them um so it was like a 2d almost kind of like so Cosmic Obzo was kind of like mist, but very humorous. And without a lot of the puzzles, just more like adventure and see what happens. So I think having that game and it being kind of a family favorite when I was growing up really affected my ability to look at games like American Arcadia and some of the walking sims. And because it was that was that kind of just exploration and just having fun gameplay was part of my gaming experience growing up. So that kind of gaming kind of cemented to me what video games could also be these kind of games. Whereas I think a lot of people that grew up with mostly just action and and side-scrolling and RPGs and stuff, there was always some sort of violence or beating a level or something. When Walking Sims came out, people were like, oh, there's no point to this. Whereas I had my past experience with Cosmic Osmo to say, oh, okay, I can I can immediately kind of understand where these kind of games are coming from because it's about what you're seeing and what you're doing and not necessarily getting good at it. So um, I didn't really think about that until right now, but that, that I think that greatly affected the kind of games that I play nowadays. Yeah, uh, that's a good point. Yeah. I, I don't think that that's probably one of the reasons I've, I'm not especially into that genre now is because I don't think I've ever ever played one as a kid yeah like i've tried them out a couple times in my 30s and 40s but i'll say i don't want to say been turned off by it but i or not able to appreciate it as a as a journey rather than as a thing to get good at but i never really thought about it that way that's a really good point yeah it's difficult to kind of get over your cultural norm of what you things what you think things are supposed to be when that when that notion of it is kind of turned sideways for you that's really interesting yeah uh todd why don't you read what muddle madness has to say muddle madness says interesting question I had a simple setup, an NES, SNES in my room so I could play all I wanted. And since my mom was a gamer who loved her RPGs, I had access to lots of the good ones. I still remember me and my mom beating Lufia 2 together after renting it for a few weeks. Wow. I still love all my RPGs today when I can play. That's awesome. That is awesome. Having a parent that can play RPGs with you, like that would have been my dream back then. Yeah, my... My, my, my mother liked uh, Arkanoid a lot, so mm. she got the, um, the Arkanoid set that had the Vouse controller. Um, on oh, NES, cool. the little, yep. you know, um, the dial. Paddle. I still, yeah, the paddle. I still, I still have the controller. Um, so that, but that was about the extent of what she liked to, to do in games. Mm. Uh, my, my mom was anti video games when I was a kid. So yeah. it was always about trying to play either behind her back or in spite of her telling me not to, or, <laughs> or you know, just for a few minutes more, mom, please. Yeah. My mom was an anti. I think she liked playing. I, I think she liked us playing video games because when we were playing video games, we weren't outside of the house and she wasn't worrying about us because she was a very anxious helicoptery mom. So 
when we're in front of the TV, we're not injuring ourselves. <laughs> um, but she wouldn't she wouldn't play video games. She got really into playing solitaire on our on that same Mac when we had it back in the day. But that was really about it. Um, she doesn't even play games on her phone or anything at this point. And then my dad would play some games. Like I remember him playing a whole season of Tecmo Bowl on the NES. Um, I remember he really liked the um, the electronic arts like Jungle Strike and Urban Strike. Those. Uh, isometric helicopter games. He always liked war stuff. Um, and then he was really into World of Tanks before he passed away. He had this whole like community that he was a part of and stuff. Um, so, and he worked in like as a for a defense contractor, worked for Pratt and Whitney. So he kind of was always into that jet fighters and tanks and all that stuff. So that that kind of um, he glommed onto that when it came to video games. But um, yeah, having a, having a parent that would play video games with me would have been something I would have absolutely loved. So that's what I try to do. I tried to do with Eddie, but he didn't really care. <laughs> but Logan and I will play lots of video games together. And I think I I really appreciate spending that time with him. And I hope that he appreciates that time with me too. And even Mila will play like, um, she's been playing Minecraft Dungeons with Logan a lot. And they'll play Snipper Clips and they'll play Mario and a whole bunch of stuff together. And they've been playing like some tower defense games on their mobile phones together. So I think that's a, just a good way to bond with kids nowadays because it's something that they love and if we have that that ability to do so i think we should do it as much as we can joe what does utopian Nima have to say he says my setup and level of access definitely molded the way i approach games today my brother and i shared a room and a 19 inch tv when we were younger but by the time i bought a genesis i had my own room and the tv went with me i had an old 70s fisher receiver and speakers you know the ones made out of actual wood it wasn't big or particularly loud by 70s stereo standards, but it was light years ahead of a mono TV speaker. As such, I was able to enjoy stereo VGM starting about 1990. Nice. And I spent more time than anyone I knew just listening to sound tests. <laughs> Nemo and I would have been good friends growing up. Yeah, for sure. My dad didn't really limit access at all. Consequently, I spent significantly more time playing games and thinking about them than I did on school. Coming from a single parent home in a declining lower middle class neighborhood where my dad spent all his energies trying to put food on the table, I didn't have or get a lot of discipline. So when I was home, I usually played video games or watched TV. And although I was an intelligent kid, I barely graduated. I knew my inability to prioritize things I knew I should do over things I wanted to do had a big part in that. Okay, I'm rambling. To cut the rest short, my current setup is inconvenient so most, since most of it gets put away when not in use, and I'm always sharing the space and screens with my kids. But it's all by design. Keeping my setup transitory helps me keep gaming in balance, so I don't start neglecting my family and responsibilities. I don't game as much as I would if left to my own devices, but for me, it's what I need. Yeah, I think having a modern setup uh, is important, too, and... I have so many moving pieces <laughs> in this room that we're sitting in right now um, that it really, like, I can set it up in multiple ways. Like, I've got three different screens that I can play, like the TV, the computer monitor, and then the tube TV. But then beyond that, I've got uh, a racing setup with pedals on wheels that I can wheel over in front of either screen. Um, I can move. I got a very light coffee table that I have specifically so I can move it out of the way if I want to do, like, use this space as a VR area. Um, or if I'm doing like uh, a light gun game on the TV, I'll move all the tables out of the way and then I'll use like the back of my computer chair as like a an armrest so I can like stage the gun on top of there when I'm playing House of the Dead or something. So I like, I like having a module kind of room or depending on the type of game I want to play, I can easily move things into place to do it. And um, there's so many different ways to play games now too. It's ridiculous. Do you guys have anything like that or are you just pretty much... I'm, Plop on the couch and play. Um, my uh, thing that I wanted my whole life was my own gaming room because I just had the family TV room when yeah. I was a kid. And yours is nice. Um, and yeah, when we bought our house about 10 years ago, uh, my wife said I could do what I want with the basement and uh, it's become my nerd cave. And I've uh, used basically every square inch of space for storage, display, and gaming. And I'm really happy with it. I'm actually building a new uh, record cabinet this weekend to uh, display my records cool. and uh, it's uh, something like you I continuously uh, you know, build new new shelves or new cabinets for it just to try to make things more convenient and more be better on display and more e easier to use and easier to move and um, so I'm always I'll say evolving my room to the point where it's uh, you know matching my style and my needs nice I don't play anything that doesn't basically just involve a controller like I don't play any driving games that aren't, you know, like burnout, like like gamified 
yeah types of Stuff driving games where you don't need any particular like driving skill like uh like Gran Turismo or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Like arcade racers, basically. R- right, right. Um, uh, so I don't have any, like, steering wheel setups. Um, I have the, like, gun attachment thing for the Wii. I think that came with a game that uh, I bought. It came with the Lynx crossbow. The Lynx crossbow training, right. <laughs> um, but I think that's pretty much all that I ever used it for. <laughs> maybe maybe also my wife likes um, the Resident Evil um, Umbrella Chronicles. Oh, yeah. Those games, so we yep. played... We played those games with the, those are super fun with the attachments. Yeah, on we my my wife loves gun con games, mm-hmm. so she when we met she had a like PS2 with Point Blank and uh, Time Crisis. Time Crisis, yeah. Um, she had a, the PS2 gun cons and Time Crisis, and and she played that a lot. Cool. Um, so she likes that kind of stuff, but for me, mostly just regular regular controller based stuff. Makes sense to me. Yeah, I, I recently got a Send End Light Gun, which is. Uh, uh, a light gun for flat screen TVs. It's basically got an Arduino inside with a uh, the the lens or the 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 barrel of the gun actually hides a camera. The camera looks at the screen, feeds the image back to the computer, so it knows exactly where it's yeah. shooting on the screen. Cool. So it's compatible with just about anything. It basically emulates a mouse. So if you have a, a console emulator where like. You want to play a, a Super Scope game on the SNES, and the emulator allows you to use the mouse as the Super Scope reticle. This gun will be compatible with it. So, and then all the, you know, like House of the Dead remake and all that stuff that's coming out nowadays. As long as you can use the mouse to point out what you're going to shoot, you can use it as a light gun. So it's it's a really versatile little piece of equipment, um, and I've been getting a lot of use out of it. So it's been a lot of fun doing that. She also really liked House of the Dead Overkill, which, if you haven't played that, is a journey. Yes, <laughs> and full of f bombs. Uh, yes, yes, uh, lots we, of lots of swearing, and the ending is a thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we featured that on Pixel Tunes way back in the day, and uh, oh, it, it, basically, it's like if Tarantino directed a House of the Dead game. It, yeah, exactly, exactly. That game <laughs> came out of nowhere. <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, all right, so let's read Ryan Steele. Um, so this was the one that was calling back. This is the one that is the callback to the one that he already responded to. Um, he says, my gaming setup as a chicken kidlet was a CRT TV in either bedroom or living room. I was predominantly a Nintendo kid and PC sometimes, playing real-time strategy in Sims on the PC and Nintendo 64 classics. I have an older sister who was really into niche rig video games, so I would openly attempt to play games she was into. Maybe it was niche RPG video games? Yeah, I think yeah, niche RPG be. video games. And I would openly attempt to play games she was into and a much older brother who wanted to co-op Double Dragon. Being mainly Nintendo consoles, I missed a lot of games and a lot of genres of games. So I guess, I guess, given this, she probably won't be too upset about what he said about her. Wedding. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> now that she's living in Japan and is into RPGs, I'm pretty right, sure yeah. she's. I'm down picturing with it. like a ten-year-old kid sitting in like your rig, playing like, <laughs> l- like, 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 like an eight-bit version of SnowRunner. <laughs> Rad Racer with a wheel. Ooh, I gotta try that. That'd be Whoa, fun. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Um, my gaming setup has evolved and it's elaborate. So I quickly realized that playing emulated games on a PC is not for me. I've played some emulated games on my phone, but that is also Mass City. Yeah, phone emulation is dumb. Um, I need the real deal that replicates my childhood while getting that FOMO hit. It really started in college when I started retro game collecting, buying up all the games I missed out on, specifically a lot of PS2 and PS1 gems. However, that got expensive, which will tie very nicely into the other subject, unless this section is after first, then I destroyed my segue, which you did. See segue. Um, See previous thing about game collecting. So now, like you fine fellows, the new drug came, Lord Everdrive. I want an authentic experience at the highest quality within reason. My home setup is really just a sharp HDTV circa 2010 era that does a really good job playing games hooked up over component cable. It's that merger of HD and playing retro games very well. I recently got into playing PS2 games off a memory drive and using a wireless adapter for my PS5 controller. I'm experiencing all these games I missed out on at a fraction of the cost. The insane person in me built an arcade cabinet from my recently acquired Sega Saturn. Nice. Yeah, it's cool. I told my story in the Discord. It took two months of planning, ordering, and building. More money than I care to add up, but it's beautiful and it plays wonderfully. Downside, it's located in my heated man cave shop, which is outside my house. It's tough to find time to play. I find playing games on my couch the best way for me to actually sit down and finish a game. I really struggle to do so not in that environment. I've decided that I need more discipline instead of bouncing around games and only playing 10 minutes, to be like the inner child I once was and be content with the games I have and beat as many as I can. What's the point in having the entire console library at my disposal if I can't actually play through one? 
And I think that's what a lot of people do with EverDrives is they will only put like a handful of games on there that they want to play at that particular time. And it helps them kind of stick to those games and actually play them. Unlike a person like me who will throw the entire console collection on one giant SD card on their EverDrive. And they're like, oh, I want to play some Super Nintendo. But you don't actually think about what game you want to play. So you sit here with this list of a thousand games and you're like, oh, now I have complete dysfunction in terms of yeah. executing this decision. It's definitely a problem I've run into it with yeah. with, uh, with EverDrives. It's like drinking from a fire hose. Yep. And it's like, what do I want to play? Let's play this. No, man, maybe put five minutes into it, and then it's so easy to get back to the menu with just a <laughs> with just a hotkey, you know, yeah. combination. You go back and you play another game for five minutes, and you don't, but you don't actually like de- like commit. I've I've genuinely found that deciding what game I want to play before I sit down and turn on the EverDrive works a lot better than browsing through the list and like trying to find one that pops out at you. So I think I do that more, and usually I just wait until. I see like a video on something or see a like a tweet about a particular game and I'm like, oh, that inspires me to go play it and I'll play it. Same here. Um, I, I'll have I, the whole library, but yeah, I'll go to it with a game in mind. I, I, Otherwise, I'd have the same thing where right. I play two minutes each. I have plenty of games on, on Steam and PC that I'm currently like actively playing. But as far as retro games go, I just kind of wait for that inspiration to hit. Um, like I was inspired to go play some tournament fighters on the Genesis because I just... Got that nostalgia hit when I was thinking about my old bedroom and my and my old Genesis. So, <laughs> and I played it and realized how much it sucked. So, <laughs> talk about a mem moment. Um, but yeah, uh, Ryan's Saturn setup is pretty cool. He took uh, a bunch of Saturn, like the light gun for the Saturn, the controller, and an arcade stick, and wired them through a switch box because they're just like db9 connectors Mm. so now with the arcade system he can just flip a knob and switch between the arcade stick the controller and the light gun so he can awesome yeah kind of play with whatever he wants oh cool that was really cool and um he got a he got a fenrir ode for the saturn too so he can just pick whatever game he wants off it i gotta get me one of those yeah Yeah, same here they are super cool um all right so let's move on to metal man this is our last Metal Man writes, the "The childhood gaming setup that first comes to mind is actually my brother's when I was too young to have a console of my own. I would sneak into his room to play his Nintendo when he wasn't around, and I would play as long as I thought I could get away with it. This naturally led to me spending a lot of time on Kung Fu Master and the first one or two levels of Ghosts and Goblins. Getting to a later stage was nerve-wracking, not only because it was hard to get that far in the game, but because playing that long meant I was pushing my luck. (laughs) Sooner or later, I'd come back home and notice that the TV and Nintendo were still warm. (gasps) (laughs) <laughs> Scandal. <laughs> I'm not sure if this influenced my taste in games, but I can say that playing a game when I'm not supposed to be doing that does make the experience a bit more fun and thrilling. <laughs> I'm laughing because it was the same thing with my mom. <laughs> oh man, she couldn't know that I was playing and I'd always have to like hope that the game console cooled down quick enough. <laughs> Sorry for the, the interruption. Going back, uh, later on I got my own console and a small TV and I was allowed to play for at least a few minutes most days. That gave me plenty of time to practice tough platformers like Ninja Gaiden and get in RPGs like Final Fantasy and Dragon Warrior that I never would have had enough time for if I were using someone else's system. Put those two experiences together and you might guess what college was like for me. Lots of sneaking back to my room so I could play Final Fantasy 7 or 8 for 30 minutes before I have to walk back to campus for my next class. That's funny. <laughs> it's funny because the same thing kind of happens now where Logan will get on the VR headset without asking me. And it'll be like like we have a standing Thursday night like mini golf thing with, with Justin and some of our friends. So he'll like, so I'll be like, all right, time to play some golf with my buds and I'll get to the helmet and it'll be like the battery will be completely drained out of it. I'll be like, Logan. <laughs> um, oh, but I hadn't had that thought about the, the system getting warm and like the TV <laughs> being warm it, until I read this. Well, wow, that's such... That's a real like nostalgia hit for me to read Yeah, that. that was never a thing for us. Like nobody was ever worried about how much we play video games so oh, that's no, I, funny. I, had to, I had to be careful about it and like i would always start to panic if i would like put my hand on top of the old tv and it felt warm and i was like "Uh oh i'm gonna get in trouble i better like finish up get like a window fan and like just hold it up to the console <laughs> try to blow the heat <laughs> off it <laughs> oh man so many good times um Thanks for that, middleman. I appreciate that. I hadn't, <laughs> I haven't thought about that in thirty years. And this is why we overpay for old games now. Yeah, that is great. All right, that pretty much wraps up our show. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Thank you for your responses. 
Uh, like I said, if you are a listener to the show, you're not on our Discord, um, you would prefer to have these uh, topics sent to you in a different way, um, you can reach out to me at the VGEmbassy at gmail.com and uh, just let me know. I, I can send you a topic via email. It's usually a couple days before we record, so you can you can send a response back to me and I'll make sure to get it onto the show. Uh, in terms of Patreon, you guys are all pretty much on our Discord anyway, so I always put the Patreon topic in the exclusive Discord lounge, which you can join by pledging at least $1 per month and uh, that one dollar a month also gets you access to vgm prime time which is a third bonus show on the vg embassy series which you will get every month uh usually a supplemental to the main vg embassy show that we put out uh coming up next month on the vg embassy uh we're gonna have another blind listen it's been quite a while since we've done one uh, I've got Cam Worma coming down to the old VG Embassy Studios, and I believe we're going to be listening to a soundtrack submission from Utopian Nemo, so that should be oh, cool. a fun one. Uh, so, as always, I'd like to thank all of our Patreon patrons for supporting the show. Cameron Childs and the Phantom are on our tourist level. Our VG Embassy series, Periodical, Chris Murray, Chris Myers, Cannon Eleven, Keyglyph, Kyle Kroll, The Dyad, and Professor Tom. Our audio attaché members, Cameron Worma, Carlos, Muddle Madness, and Scott McElhone. And as always, our dear friend at the Special Agent tier, Ryan Steele. I was actually joking with Ryan earlier that I thought it would be more convenient to actually fly him out for our embassy exclusives. <laughs> to have him read his own testimonials. <laughs> um, but they are they are amazing. They are very long, but they are quite entertaining. So we really appreciate them as always. That's so, what she said? Very long, but quite entertaining. Sure. Well, we'll go with that. Maybe more like that's what he said. I don't I don't know. Okay. Anyways, uh, so we will see you guys in a couple weeks with another episode of the VG Embassy. And then uh, Embassy Exclusive will be kind of a holiday thing. So look out for more topics based around that stuff. We'll see you guys then. Take care, everyone. See ya. Bye.